Welcome to EM Cases Rapid Reviews, where we review the take-home points from the EM Cases main episode podcasts so you can ace your exams and take stellar care of your patients. Hi, I'm Dr. Eileen Chung, and this is part two of the rapid review of EM Cases episode six on transient ischemic attack. In part one, we talked about the presentation of a TIA and the ER workup. Now in part two, we'll look at the acute management of patients with TIA, who is safe to send home, and who might require an admission. Also, up until now, our review of TIAs has focused on diagnosing anterior circulation TIAs. But vertigo can be a presenting complaint of a posterior circulation TIA or stroke. So we'll also take a quick run-through of an approach to vertigo, focusing on the red flags for a central cause of vertigo, like a posterior circulation TIA. Let's dive right into management. Our goal in treating someone who's just had a TIA is to optimize cerebral blood flow. So there are some critical do's and don'ts. First off, many of these patients present with an elevated blood pressure. A rise in blood pressure is the body's way of increasing cerebral blood flow. So resist your gut instinct to acutely lower the patient's blood pressure using IV medications. Do rehydrate patients who appear to be clinically dehydrated. And then there's the great antiplatelet discussion. Which medication is best? Surprisingly, there's no great evidence to support one antiplatelet agent over another in the hyperacute setting of an ER presentation of a TIA. But this is what our experts would recommend. Aspirin. If the patient's not already on it, load them with 160 to 325 milligrams chewed once you know there's no bleed on head CT and there isn't another obvious cause of their symptoms. They should be discharged on 81 milligrams of aspirin daily. If the patient already is on aspirin, first make sure they've been compliant with it. If they are compliant, you have a couple of choices. One choice is to switch the patient to clopidogrel or Plavix alone. A loading dose of 300 milligrams should be given in the ER and they should continue on 75 milligrams of Plavix on discharge. Plavix alone should also be given to patients who were not already on aspirin before their TIA and have a true aspirin allergy. Another choice for a patient who is already on aspirin is to add Plavix. There is an increased risk of bleed when both of these agents are used together in the long term. But in the short term, while waiting for further investigation of their TIA and its cause, this is a reasonable practice. They should be loaded with Plavix in the ER, then discharged home on aspirin and Plavix. Let your patient know that this combination is only temporary. Agrinox is a combination medication of dipyramidal and aspirin, and while neurologists may put a patient who's had a stroke or TIA on Agrinox for secondary prevention, this is not a good choice for the eMERGE doc in the acute setting. You can't load it, and a common side effect is bad headaches, which then leads to a return visit to the ER and a repeat CT scan to rule out an intracranial hemorrhage. What about anticoagulation with heparin? There is no role for the eMERGE doc to start this acutely in the ER in someone who's had a TIA or a stroke because of the high risk of an intracranial bleed. So let's review your antiplatelet strategy for someone who's presenting with a TIA. Aspirin for someone not previously on aspirin. If the patient already was on aspirin and adherent, you can either switch to Plavix alone or use a combination of aspirin and Plavix in the short term while they're waiting to complete their TIA workup. Agronox is not recommended in the acute setting, and there's no role for using heparin in this case in the ER either. So you've made a diagnosis of TIA, and you've got your head CT, EKG, and blood work, which are all unremarkable. Your patient's neurologic symptoms have completely resolved. Now, do you keep them in the hospital or send them home? A lot of that decision is likely going to depend on how high a risk your patient has of having a stroke in the immediate future. How can we predict this? Luckily, there's a tool for that. It's called the ABCD2 score, and it's a highly relevant risk stratification tool for the ER doc because it predicts risk of stroke within the next two days in someone who's had a TIA. Let's review the components of the score and how to interpret it. A stands for age, and the patient gets a point if they're older than 60. B is for blood pressure. The patient gets a point if their systolic BP is over 140 or their diastolic is over 90. C is for clinical features. Two points for unilateral weakness, one point only for speech disturbance without weakness, and zero points for other symptoms. Next, there are two Ds in this rule. The first is for duration of symptoms. Two points if the symptoms lasted more than 60 minutes, 
one point of symptoms lasted 10 to 60 minutes, and no points of the symptoms lasted fewer than 10 minutes. The second D is for diabetes. The patient gets a point if they have it. The patients at low risk for stroke in the next two days if their total score is 0 to 3, moderate risk of stroke if their total score is 4 to 5, and high risk of stroke if their score is 6 to 7. Now that we've risk stratified our patient, we can use this information to decide who might need admission and who we can send home. There are two reasons to admit a patient who's just had a TIA. The first is if that patient has been risk stratified as high risk and there's no access to urgent vascular imaging. That means you're not able to get a CTA of their head and neck or carotid dopplers in the ER that day or are unlikely to be able to get them those tests within the next three days. The second reason to admit is if that patient's unlikely to be able to follow up for further workup with their TIA based on social reasons as an outpatient. If your patient doesn't meet those criteria, it's reasonable to have them finish their TIA workup as an outpatient with urgent vascular imaging or follow up with a TIA or stroke clinic if you have access to one. And if you're sending someone home, don't forget to put them on an antiplatelet. Or if you found new AFib in your patient, they should be on anticoagulation since their CHAD-65 score would be one or more based on the 2014 CCS guidelines, given that they've just had a TIA. Unless, of course, their risk of bleed outweighs their risk of stroke. Finally, if your patient's hypertensive, you might also want to start them on a low-dose oral antihypertensive on discharge. We spent the majority of this rapid review on anterior circulation TIAs. Let's switch gears to talk about vertigo and the presentations that might trigger you to think about posterior circulation TIA or stroke, or other central causes. Dizziness is one of those presentations that we all love to hate because it means different things to different people. So here's a practical stepwise approach to thinking about it. The first step is to figure out what your patient actually means by dizzy. Is it presyncope where they felt like they were gonna pass out or syncope where they actually did pass out? Is it truly vertigo where they describe the sensation that they're moving or that their surroundings are moving even when they're perfectly still? Remember, vertigo doesn't have to be a spinning sensation. Is it disequilibrium, where they felt unbalanced? Or was it non-specific lightheadedness? Once you've determined that this is truly vertigo, the next step is to consider the cause. The biggest clue in helping you narrow the differential is how long the vertigo lasted. Specifically, you need to ask the patient how long they actually felt the sensation that they were moving, as opposed to how long they felt unwell, because they can feel unwell long after the vertigo itself actually stops. Pay attention if your patient says their vertigo lasted minutes or days. The duration of these episodes may signal a posterior circulation TIA or stroke. There are other red flags on history or physical that make you worry that the vertigo is from a central and not a peripheral cause. On history, a red flag for a central cause would include bulbar symptoms. So any of diplopia, ataxia, dysarthria, or dysphagia. Another red flag is if the vertigo is non-positional. It's there no matter what position or movement the patient makes. Other red flags would be if the patient's not able to walk, if there are any focal neurologic deficits, or if the patient has risk factors for stroke. It's a good tip also to remember that all vertigo gets worse with head movement, so it's not a helpful feature in differentiating between worrisome and benign causes. There are also red flags on physical exam. Worry about a central cause for your patient's vertigo if they have either vertical nystagmus or if they have bidirectional or direction-changing nystagmus. What does that mean? It means that when your patient looks left, the nystagmus beats left. And when the patient looks right, the nystagmus beats right. This shouldn't happen with peripheral vertigo. Limb ataxia is also worrisome, as is any focal neurologic deficit you find. The bottom line here is that if there are any red flags on history and physical, you'd want to think twice about sending that person home without further consultation. The take-home messages for this part of our rapid review of TIAs are, number one, in the acute management of TIAs, our goal is to improve cerebral blood flow. So don't acutely lower a patient's blood pressure using IV meds and do load them with an antiplatelet as soon as an intracranial bleed has been ruled out. Number two, when evaluating someone with vertigo, the key to honing in on your diagnosis is to ask about the type of dizziness and how long the vertiginous episode lasted. Number three, Don't send home your high-risk TIA patients for whom you can't get urgent vascular imaging, whom you're not sure are going to be able to follow up, or who have red flags for posterior circulation stroke. And number four, 
If you're discharging a patient who's had a TIA, don't forget to send them home with an antiplatelet or an anticoagulant as appropriate. Thank you.